Well, you know, there's the universe which did happen and the universe which should have happened. And uh, pretty much everybody seems to agree that in the universe which should have happened, uh, <coughs> um, BitTorrent was written by some venture capital backed company uh, with <clears throat> which then got sued and sort of kind of got acquired after getting sued into oblivion and the CEO having a scare of almost having been thrown in prison or actually having been thrown in prison. Um, of course in the in the universe which actually happened which doesn't really make any sense so it's hardly worth talking about but in the universe which actually happened, BitTorrent was written by some guy in his living room who was living off of credit cards and became explosively huge <laughs> prior to taking any investment whatsoever. And then the person who wrote it somehow wound up working with Hollywood <laughs> and, and running a, a very legal business without any uh, legally scary situations. So when you have television or radio, and by that I mean television over the airwaves, it's kind of like somebody screaming really, really loudly <laughs> and everybody else can listen. Uh, and so anyone who wants to can tune in. Now this it's not very efficient from an energy standpoint. It involves some very, very loud screaming. <laughs> uh, it is highly effective at broadcasting signals to space aliens. If there were any aliens hanging out around Earth in the, uh, uh, in the 1900s, they'd have had a very, very easy time watching television and getting a good look at our culture that way, because that's where most of the signal is going, is out in space. But <laughs> uh, if uh, the internet doesn't work that way. On the internet, you have all these machines that are connected to the net, and you can send a message to anyone else on the net, but it goes to just them. There's no broadcast concept there. So there's this question of how do you make broadcasting work. Uh, unfortunately, broadcasting can be rather difficult in that if you have something that's very popular and very large and very high quality, it, it can become very expensive to distribute it. It gets expensive to be popular. With broadcasts over the airwaves, this doesn't happen. You know, you're screaming loud enough, everybody can hear you, not a problem. On the internet, it's a huge problem. So BitTorrent was based on this very fundamental calculation of like, well, if you're sending out something and everyone wants the same thing, they could just send it to each other. <laughs> so uh, there's this logistical problem of how to make that happen. So I figured out how to make it happen. Uh, well, the basic problem is a pretty simple one. There's plenty of upload capacity out there not being used. How do we use it? So. Uh, <clears throat> that's a, a, a trivial calculation on its own. The problem is these are what you call low quality resources. They're peers. They are of, they are untrusted. They are of unknown potential transfer rate. They are of not terribly good potential transfer rate to begin with. Um, uh, and they're just not very coordinated. <laughs> this isn't really so much a problem of make something that works so much as make something that works reliably that can handle the fact that peers just sort of disappear and never come back again. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> and at the time I started working on it, there were a bunch of other people working on uh, very much the same thing. I, I decided on an approach that was actually much, much more ambitious than a lot of the things which had been successful up until that time, in that you, <clears throat> when you're distributing something on the internet, if you're doing it via HTTP, you kind of don't want everyone to come and download the same thing at the same time. You want nice small things that are kind of distributed uh, around when people download them. And this is good for making it so that you don't have too much load all at once on the one central server. And 
I went and did this calculation and figured, well, no, I want to do the exact opposite thing. <laughs> I want everyone downloading the same thing at the same time. Because if, and the, this at the time was a pretty big if, if you can get a handle on all the difficult logistical problems of making it actually happen, then you'll be able to make it so that the initial place only has to upload one copy of the whole thing and everything else will be distributed between peers and you actually get maximum efficiency in the very situation you were trying so hard to avoid when you were doing everything via HTTP. So in that sense I was being rather ambitious although other people were working on uh, the same problem. The difference was in terms of approach that I came up with an architecture which was designed first around reliability and, and efficiency, in fact, only in terms of reliability <laughs> and efficiency with almost, it's an utterly bizarre architecture if, unless you consider it from the point of view of, okay, first thing, let's just assume that peers are unreliable, that we don't know what transfer rates are, <laughs> that, and that peers are untrusted and tend to go away, and then out of what's left, how do we make something work? and uh, other people were trying these uh, very uh, tree-based architectures, which prove not to work, but the reasons why uh, are very much centered around reliability and aren't obvious unless you've done some networking and know that just peers go away and never come back. <laughs> a, a DRM has a lot of political momentum right now, and just sort of this like, well, if you're, if you're, if you're putting content up online, you have to have DRM. And whether this is psychological, whether technicals are saying it, whether lawyers are saying it, whether just collectively everybody feels that someone must be saying it so you have to speak in one voice of demanding it, is a little unclear and varies from place to place. I mean, when you go to the movie theater, you pay. When you go get a DVD, you pay. When you go rent a DVD, you pay. The thing that people associate with their home experience, there, there are a few things going on. One of the big things is what people associate with their home experience is watching television. You turn on the television, you watch. A and people are rather disinclined in, in uh, some ways for uh, paying for watching something at home. They want it to just have ads and just watch it uh, <clears throat> by analogy with television. A another thing that happens is people are leery of are frequently leery of paying for anything online, just putting in a credit card number because credit cards are so fundamentally insecure uh, makes people very nervous. They, they don't want to do that and it's an annoying process entering in your credit card number. Now the ridiculous insecurity of credit card numbers has a lot to do with the ridiculous way banks work in the United States where things are big and bloated and slow and poorly done technologically and they have very little, if any, incentive to fix it. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, the other thing is that people are a little used to now when they download videos uh, from the net for not paying for it. It's just what they've been doing. The, the uh, paying for it model uh, just hasn't been there. <laughs> so, so people just habitually uh, aren't very used to paying for things. At a certain point, when you get down to a certain level of cost, the actual price being charged is de minimis, uh, whether that's a dollar or 10 cents or one cent. It's a little hard to say. But at some point, the actual price paid it, it ceases to be a concern. Uh, and that's for extremely popular content. Uh, that de minimis price is one that isn't very de minimis when you <laughs> multiply over uh, the number of people <coughs> who are paying it. Uh, that's uh, effectively what, uh, what advertising online winds up being, that monetization of it on it is uh, small, uh, generally speaking less than a penny per impression, but winds up adding up in the end. Uh, the question there becomes what is the form of that monetization? Is it via advertising, which people are sort of implicitly paying for in some way? Is it explicitly paying, which there is this usability issue of making the payment? 
and also you know, worry issue of fraudulent charges happening when this payment is happening, concerns about incentivizing spam, body, body, blah, blah, uh, blah. So at a certain, at a certain level, there's the, there's the cost of the distribution, and then there's the value gotten from the thing. And if the cost is some very small fraction of the value gotten from the thing, people cease to pay any attention to it whatsoever. <laughs> and uh, the, the question then becomes, what is the form of the payment? A advertising is certainly a compelling model just in that it's very, very simple. There's no, uh, when, whenever you have payment going uh, through a distributor, there's the whole issue of making the payment happen, both in terms of uh, authorizing charges and in redistributing the money, and it has to somehow hook into the payment system. And advertising is somewhat inefficient in that it implicitly hooks into the payment system via some complicated route of people watching the advertising doing something eventually somewhere out there. Uh, but it's much, much simpler in general. It's a straightforward way of doing things.